Thank you all for coming out today. This is a uh, very interesting time. Uh, I think that the uh, President, in his October 13th decision and speech uh, to not recertify, actually, I think, followed just about exactly the right path. He didn't break out of the agreement, but he communicated that the agreement was vulnerable. Uh, he also reminded all of us that the agreement's not just about nuclear weapons, but that the way the uh, corker Cardin bill was written, part of decertification can be a function of national interest and a function of activities other than uh, the nuclear program. And I think in that sense, it's a really, it was a watershed event uh, for him to say, this is not going well enough for me to be able to certify as president that it's in our national interest to continue it. But at the same time, I think it was prudent to not leave the agreement, but rather to say the agreement has to be revisited, it has to be rethought, and it may well have to be renegotiated. Uh, my position, and I did a, an article which both appeared at foxnews.com and, and as a newsletter that I wrote last week, uh, which was entitled Death to America, because I think it reframes what this is really all about. This, this is, in the end, not about the nuclear program. Uh, this is, in the end, about a dictatorship uh, which defined in its very constitution that it was a revolutionary regime with uh, global aspirations. This is about a regime which just, I think, three or four weeks ago, the parliament, in passing a defense bill, was chanting death to America. Now, as a historian, I am always leery when I see dictatorships that use certain kind of language. Now, I think if you're you know, an academic intellectual of the right kind of liberal persuasion, you can probably say to yourself, well, death to America is really a symbolic communication that means uh, we're unhappy and would like to order tea uh, or something. But actually, historically, uh, you know, when, when, when one of the reasons that Churchill understood Hitler is he actually is probably the only British parliamentarian of his generation who read Mein Kampf. And when you read Mein Kampf, you realize that Hitler was insane, and you also realize that he was determined to live out his insanity by hating people, and that when he hated people, he wanted to destroy them. And so from the time that Churchill read that, his entire view of the world changed because he understood that, in fact, uh, Hitler was not somebody that you could negotiate with, compromise with, uh, because he represented such a terrible future. Well, we've gone through a long, elaborate process in the Western world of trying to continually re-explain the Iranian dictatorship. And, and let me emphasize, first of all, it is a, it's a dictatorship with a facade of democracy. But if you're not part of the dictatorship and you're not acceptable to the dictator, you can't run. And therefore, to pretend that the elections actually offer any serious choice to the Iranian people uh, is, is simply a fantasy. Second, the regime itself routinely, consistently tells you who they are. You know, when, when, they, ha when they have a missile, for example, on which they paint death to Israel before they test it, and they take a picture of the missile so you can see that it says death to Israel, there's some reason to believe they're giving you a hint. They also have other missiles that have death to America. They sort of alternate which one they really want to kill first. Um, and so I think what President Trump did in his decision, and I thought this was a very important moment for his administration. I think if he had said, gee, I really, and remember, he'd gone to the United Nations and he had made a speech which had probably the strongest condemnation of Iran, of the Iranian dictatorship, ever uttered at the United Nations. For him to then turn from that and, and passively certify would have made a mockery of everything he had said. And, and what he said was very strong. But instead, by decertifying, he signaled that he was actually listening to his own words. And then maybe the rest of us should also listen to his words. And then if you look at the decertification speech, which I think without question is the most methodical outline of how bad the dictatorship is that any American senior leader has ever uttered. I mean, it's quite a remarkable speech. And what it tells you is that in the long run, it is not just in the interest of the United States to find a better way to do inspections or to find some other device that allows us to continue with the current agreement. It is in the long run in the interest of the United States to find a way to replace the dictatorship. 
that as long as that dictatorship is in power, as long as it is able to spend money, as long as it's able to project terrorism around the world, it is a, a long, ultimately a mortal danger to the United States. And of course, it is a terrible thing for the Iranian people. I mean, we have a dictatorship which, which in 1988 killed 30,000 people, uh, something which for some reason the New York Times and the Washington Post don't find to be horrifying. Um, again, they're surviving by sheer repression. I mean, it, it is a fantasy to suggest that, that the, the dictatorship would survive without repression. And so you have a repressive dictatorship which projects power all, all the, now all the way to the Mediterranean, has plans to build a port in Lebanon that it would control, has plans to build missile factories in both Syria and Lebanon, uh, ultimately d designed to destroy Israel already has helped uh, Hezbollah get something on the order of 75 to 100,000 missiles, uh, creating, I think, a, a much bigger problem on the northern front uh, for Israel than, than anybody has come to grips with yet. I mean, we have, we have no models for how you deal with a threat on this scale. And it's all going to get worse. And so I think what the president has begun, particularly by extending beyond talking about the nuclear agreement by talking about the IRGC and beginning to say, look, here is the heart of the problem. It is a Revolutionary Guard Corps dedicated to terrorism. It's a Revolutionary Guard Corps dedicated, and this goes all the way back against the Americans, to the 1979-1983 period. Uh, from the perspective of the Revolutionary Guard Corps, they've been at war with us even if we weren't aware that we were at war with them. And so I think you've got to see it in that context. I think the Treasury took the first step in beginning to designate uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. I think that step, and this will be one of the great challenges the President faces across the whole government, that you, you can make big decisions at the top but you then have to find ways to get a bureaucracy that actually implements them in an aggressive, effective way. And I think that it's perennially a challenge when you have a system our size outside of, of a war the size of World War II. The bureaucracies are very cumbersome, very slow, very often uh, under, the, the thing you want to do is understaffed and the thing you no longer want to do is overstaffed, but you can't figure out how to get rid of the overstaffed part to be able to transfer the resources to build up the understaffed part. And so I think the administration is going to have a period here of coming to grips with how do they effectively implement the president's directions. And part of it's going to be at Treasury, where I think they, they have the potential to really dramatically weaken the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, if they put, apply the resources to it and if they're tough-minded uh, and extend it to all of the institutions. I mean, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is a large part of the Iranian economy, and if in fact we're serious about isolating them and restricting them, we're going to have a huge impact that ripples back through the entire Iranian economy. So this is an example of the sort of thing we have to think about. I also think that we, we have to look at, and then this is a real sea change, I mean, I've, I've been actively involved in this, uh, including uh, involvement uh, in trying to uh, defend the good name uh, of the National Council of Resistance of Iran and, and the uh, the MEK, all the way back to when I was speaker. Because basically the Iranian dictatorship ran uh, a false flag operation to set up uh, a, a totally phony designation, which the State Department bureaucracy went along with. So for a long period of time, we were willing to listen to the actual dictatorship while not listening to the resistance, even though the resistance was trying to tell us the truth about the dictatorship, which was lying to us. And we've gradually worked our way back through, and some of you have been involved in this for your entire adult lifetime. And you, you know that this has been a very difficult, at times, uh, at places like Camp Liberty and Camp Ashraf, a very painful uh, process. But I think that we are beginning to move in the right direction. And my hope is that the administration will now go all the way in the direction of reaching out to and working with the sources of information. In my experience, um, the elements of the National Council of Resistance of Iran who are still inside Iran, and there are thousands of people who are obviously uh, highly uh, quiet about this because otherwise they'd be picked up by the secret police and killed, 
but they have been the best source of information on the nuclear program consistently and have found things when the CIA was telling us they didn't exist. And I hope that this administration will now, as part of this process of beginning to unravel uh, both the IRGC and then ultimately the dictatorship, uh, will reach out in a much more collaborative way to coordinate information and to coordinate advice uh, and to find ways to, to work together. Uh, because I do believe that, in fact, uh, the National Council of Resistance of Iran has a tremendous potential. And I also want to say that I believe that, that uh, Mrs. Rajavi has done an amazing job of leading an organization through a very long, very difficult period. And I would hope that at some point in the near future that she would be given an invitation to, to officially visit the United States uh, and to have a chance both to meet with American leaders in Washington, but also to go around the country. I think that she is uh, one of the examples of a symbol of resistance to the dictatorship that would have a huge impact across uh, uh, the whole country and would also send an important signal to Europe about uh, the way in which our policies are moving. So I think these are dangerous times. I think between the, the North Korean uh, crisis and, and the Iranian challenge, uh, particularly the Iranian challenge in southern Lebanon and southern Syria, uh, that we may well have, uh, we, we may well be in the most dangerous period since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think we have to take it very seriously. It's going to take a great deal of work and a lot of courage. But I do think that the president began that process and that he deserves a great deal of credit for having uh, been willing, one, to uh, insist on decertification, and two, uh, twice now, both at the United Nations and in his speech uh, about decertification, uh, telling the truth vividly and clearly and decisively about the Iranian dictatorship in a way that no senior American political leader has ever done before. So I give the president uh, real credit for having started to move in the right direction. And it's a direction, frankly, that almost every senior American military leader understands because they are infuriated that the Iranians have been routinely helping kill Americans and have paid virtually no cost for it. Whether you go all the way back to the Marines uh, in Lebanon in the 80s or you look at what the, the, the Iranian equipment that was coming into Iraq and being used for IEDs, it clearly was manufactured in Iran uh, and was being sent in for the purpose of killing Americans. So I think you'll find that the senior military is very willing to work in a diligent, direct way to uh, undermine and isolate the Revolutionary Guard uh, and to begin the process of rolling back the Iranians uh, out of places like Lebanon and Syria and ultimately replacing uh, the dictatorship with a popularly elected government. So uh, I am, I'm strategically optimistic. I'm, I think it's an enormous amount of work ahead of us, but I think it is doable and I think the tide of history is with freedom. It's not with the dictatorship. Uh, and uh, that's why despite occasional setbacks, I think in the long run, uh, we, we will get stronger and they will get weaker. And, uh, I think uh, I'm going to join the link over here and <clears throat> we're going to uh, have a dialogue and then maybe people will be able to ask questions too. So, but thank you all very much for coming out. I think this is a very important time and an extraordinarily important topic.